Glaciers of Tall Antii. Episode 1. Glaciers of the Tall Antii King of the Illyrians. Glaciers was, according to Arian, king of the Tall Anti, an Illyrian tribe that occupied the current region of central Albania. On the other hand, Plutarch and Diodorus describe him as the king of the Illyrians. However, there should be no confusion between the terms king of the Tall Antii and king of the Illyrians. These are just alternative and complementary ways of illustrating the same picture. It should be noted that when Glaucius is referred here as king of the Illyrians, Illyria, or Illyrian kingdom, it is done for purpose of simplicity and it only suggests that he reigned over a territory that was inhabited by Illyrian tribes including the Torlantii. It does not suggest that Glaucius ruled over all the Illyrian tribes across the Balkans. Glaucius seems to have been the son of Pluratus I and thus, around 335, succeeded him on the throne of the Torlantii. Regarding the center of his kingdom, it was located somewhere around Tirana, in the ancient ruins of Perkop, controlling the plain of that region. Episode 2. Battle against Alexander the Great. Glaucius appears for the first time as a political and military figure in the events related to the campaign of Alexander the Great against the Illyrians in the summer of 335. At that time, Alexander was conducting a campaign in northwestern area of his inherited kingdom, when he was notified that Cletus, son of Bardilis, had rebelled against the Macedonian rule and that Glaucius was assisting him. Another Illyrian tribe, the Alteriati, who were apparently allied with Cletus and Glaucus, had planned to assault Alexander on his march. Alexander, anticipating the interception of the Alteriati, engaged the king of the Agrians, Langarus, to crush them in their own lands. Langarus did so energetically thus opening the way for Alexander to lead his forces against Cletus and Glaucus. The Macedonians marched safely through the valley of the Aragon, Krona, River to arrive near the city of Pelion that was captured by the Illyrian forces of Cletus and that dominated the area of Dasaretis. Meanwhile, the Illyrian forces of Glaucus were on their way to join Cletus at Pelion. Hammond rightly states that Illyrian region was already familiar to Alexander. As a royal page, he had accompanied Philip on Illyrian campaigns, and then in 337 he had escorted Olympia to Epirus and gone from there to Illyria, where he stayed with one or more kings, perhaps indeed with Glaucius. The Illyrian forces were divided into two main parts. One was positioned within Pelion while others had occupied the highest peaks around the area and above the main passes. Upon arriving near Pelion, Alexander set his camp outside the city with the aim of recapturing it by keeping the Illyrian forces divided as they were. The arrival of Glaucius and his large number of troops in the area forced Alexander in a defensive position and changed his aim of recapturing the city. The first move of the Macedonian ruler was to send Philotas, one of his commanders, with a cavalry unit, on a nearby expedition to secure food for the army. It is Arian that gives us the description of the following events. When Glaucius heard of the expedition of Philotas he marched out to meet him, and seized the mountains, which surrounded the plain, from which Philotas intended to procure forage. As soon as Alexander was informed that his cavalry and beasts of burden would be in danger if night overtook them, taking the shield-bearing troops, the archers, the Agrianians, and about four hundred cavalry, he went with all speed to their aid. The rest of the army he left behind near the city, to prevent the citizens from hastening forth to form a junction with Glaucius, as they would have done, if all the Macedonian army had withdrawn. Directly Glaucius perceived that Alexander was advancing, he evacuated the mountains, and Philotas and his forces returned to the camp in safety. But Cletus and Glaucius still imagined that they had caught Alexander in a disadvantageous position, for they were occupying the mountains, which commanded the plain by their height, with a large body of cavalry, javelin throwers, and slingers, besides a considerable number of heavy armed infantry. Moreover, the men who had been beleaguered in the city were expected to pursue the Macedonians closely if they made a retreat. The ground also through which Alexander had to march was evidently narrow and covered with wood on one side it was hemmed in by a river, 
and on the other there was a very lofty and craggy mountain so that there would not be room for the army to pass, even if only for shield bearers marched abreast. Then Alexander drew up his army in such a way that the depth of the phalanx was 120 men, and stationing 200 cavalry on each wing, he ordered them to preserve silence, in order to receive the word of command quickly. Accordingly he gave the signal to the heavy-armed infantry in the first place to hold their spears erect, and then to couch them at the concerted sign, at one time to incline their spears to the right, closely locked together, and at another time towards the left. He then set the phalanx itself into quick motion forward, and marched it towards the wings, now to the right, and then to the left. After thus arranging and rearranging his army many times very rapidly, he at last formed his phalanx into a sort of wedge, and led it towards the left against the enemy, who had long been in a state of amazement at seeing both the order and the rapidity of his evolutions. Consequently they did not sustain Alexander's attack, but quitted the first ridges of the mountain. Upon this, Alexander ordered the Macedonians to raise the battle cry and make a clatter with their spears upon their shields, and the Torlantii, being still more alarmed at the noise, led their army back to the city with all speed. As Alexander saw only a few of the enemy still occupying a ridge, along which lay his route, he ordered his bodyguards and personal companions to take their shields, mount their horses, and ride to the hill, and when they reached it, if those who had occupied the position awaited them, he said that half of them were to leap from their horses, and to fight as foot soldiers, being mingled with the cavalry. But when the enemy saw Alexander's advance, they quitted the hill and retreated to the mountains in both directions. Then Alexander, with his companions, seized the hill, and sent for the Agrianians and archers, who numbered two thousand. He also ordered the shield-bearing guards to cross the river, and after them the regiments of Macedonian infantry, with instructions that, as soon as they had succeeded in crossing, they should draw out in rank towards the left so that the phalanx of men crossing might appear compact at once. He himself, in the vanguard, was all the time observing from the ridge the enemy's advance. They, seeing the force crossing the river, marched down the mountains to meet them, with the purpose of attacking Alexander's rear in its retreat. But, as they were just drawing near, Alexander rushed forth with his own division, and the phalanx raised the battle cry, as if about to advance through the river. When the enemy saw all the Macedonians marching against them, they turned and fled. Upon this, Alexander led the Agrianians and archers at full speed towards the river, and succeeded in being himself the first man to cross it. But when he, Alexander, saw the enemy pressing upon the men in the rear, he stationed his engines of war upon the bank, and ordered the engineers to shoot from them as far forward as possible all sorts of projectiles which are usually shot from military engines. He directed the archers, who had also entered the water, to shoot their arrows from the middle of the river. But Glaucias durst not advance within range of the missiles so that the Macedonians passed over in such safety, that not one of them lost his life in the retreat. The Illyrians had no reason to engage in close combat with the Macedonian force that was leaving the site in such an organized manner. Glaucus and Cletus thought the initial Macedonian departure as a victory since they have managed to keep the city of Pelion into their possession. This initial impression caused the Illyrians to encamp carelessly near the city without expecting Alexander's return. On noticing this weakness, Alexander returned on the site three days later and caught the Illyrian forces by surprise killing many of them and capturing many others. Cletus himself managed to escape the slaughter and burned his city. Glaucius had also left the area with the surviving forces and returned to his kingdom through the surrounding mountains. After burning the city of Pelion, Cletus went into the territory of the Torlantii and found refugee in Glaucus' dominion. The defeat that Glaucius suffered at Pelion did not challenge his authority over his central possessions, which were located further west from the battlefield. On the other hand, Alexander had no intention to pursue the army of Glaucius deep in the Illyrian hinterland and risk suffering further losses in a rough and unsuitable terrain for the military formations of the Macedonians. 
The victory of Maestón at Pelion served mainly to secure the kingdom's northwestern border on the verge of the main expedition against Persia. Despite the description of classical sources, the campaign against the Illyrians proved difficult for Alexander, so much so that a news that he was killed during battle spread out in Thebes and other places under Alexander's control. This was another important reason why, soon after the victory over Glaucias and Cletus, Alexander had to return into Thebes where his presence was required in order to reaffirm his authority and prepare for his major campaign against Persia. As a result, Glaucias continued his reign for another generation over the Illyrians, including into his possessions the lands of other surrounding Illyrian tribes. Little is known about the activity of Glaucias during 334-317. Some scholars suggest that Glaucias, in addition to the lands of the Taulantii he already controlled, gradually took over the region that was once ruled by Cletus, apparently capitalizing on the fact that Alexander was engaged far away in the war against the Persians. Episode 3 – Becoming the Adoptive Father of Pyrrhus of Epirus In 317, Cassander, the ruler of Maestón, interfered in the internal affairs of Epirus, encouraging civil unrest there in a continuous effort to expand his authority over this region that was after all the homeland of Olympia, mother of Alexander the Great and thus Cassander's ultimate enemy. As a result of the civil unrest and the Macedonian pressure, Eosides, up until then the ruler of Epirus and supporter of Olympia, was forced to resign from the throne and leave his state. Eosides' two-year-old son and the rightful heir of Epirus, Pyrrhus I, was saved from Cassander's persecution and brought for protection in the court of King Glaucias. It was the same child that would later be known as Pyrrhus of Epirus or Pyrrhus the Great, one of the most skilled generals of his time who challenged the forces of the Roman Republic in the southern Italian peninsula. By the time Pyrrhus was brought in the Illyrian court, Glaucias had already established a friendly relationship with the monarchy of Epirus. Thus, the Illyrian king had married Berea, a Molossian princess, who, as Pyrrhus, was a member of the Eacidae family. Plutarch describes romantically the encounter of Glaucias with the infant Pyrrhus. Having thus outstripped their pursuers and reached a place of safety, the fugitives, supporters of Molossian monarchy, betook themselves to Glaucias the king of the Illyrians, and finding him sitting at home with his wife, they put the little child, Pyrrhus, down on the floor before them. Then the king began to reflect. He was in fear of Cassander, who was an enemy of Eosides, Pyrrhus' father, and held his peace a long time as he took counsel with himself. Meanwhile Pyrrhus, of his own accord, crept across the floor, clutched the king's robe, and pulled himself onto his feet at the knees of Glaucias, who was moved at first to laughter, then to pity, as he saw the child clinging to his knees and weeping like a formal suppliant. Some say, however, that the child did not supplicate Glaucias, but caught hold of an altar of the gods and stood there with his arms thrown round it, and that Glaucias thought this a sign from heaven. Therefore he at once put Pyrrhus in the arms of his wife, bidding her rear him along with their children, and a little while after, when the child's enemies demanded his surrender, and Cassander offered two hundred talents, about twenty thousand silver coins, for him, Glaucias would not give him up. Despite the intimate description of Plutarch, Glaucias had strategical reasons to keep the infant Pyrrhus under his protection. Epirus was of geostrategic importance in order for his kingdom to be secured from the south. The way to secure this influence over Epirus was to raise Pyrrhus safely in Illyria and to establish him on the throne of Epirus at a proper age. The establishment of Pyrrhus on the throne of Epirus would reactivate the marital relations Glaucias already had established with the family of Pyrrhus. Thus, from now on, Pyrrhus would be his adoptive son. The sitting of Pyrrhus on the throne of Epirus was realized in 309 when Glaucias, carrying Pyrrhus with him, entered into that region with a large Illyrian force. The Illyrians crushed any opposition from the pro-Macedonian group centered on King Alcetas and Pyrrhus was declared the legitimate king of Epirus. After leaving appropriate guardians to assist Pyrrhus, then twelve years of age, in governance, Glaucias returned into his kingdom victorious. 
The relations between Glaucus and Pyrrhus remained friendly in the coming years. In 302, Pyrrhus, would return into Illyria to attend the marriage of a son of Glaucus, with whom Pyrrhus was reared and whom Pyrrhus considered to be his brother. This event serves also to suggest that in 302 Glaucius was still alive and still ruling over his Illyrian kingdom. Episode 4 – Struggle for Coastal Control Before being able to put Pyrrhus on the throne of Epirus, Glaucius had to endure the military retaliation the Macedonian king. In 314, the Macedonians led by Cassander himself, sailed from Epirus and assaulted the Illyrian coast. They conquered the main cities of Apollonia and Eurachium and then entered the Illyrian hinterland. During this campaign, Glaucius and his Illyrian troops were defeated, thus forcing the Illyrian king to temporarily retreat from the coastal areas. Macedonian garrisons were put in both Dyrrhachium and Apollonia in order to keep their citizens under Macedonian rule and keep away potential Illyrian assaults. The Macedonian pressure forced Glaucius to sign a treaty of neutrality where he promised not to intervene in Epirus and its affairs. Although in difficult position after this Macedonian invasion, Glaucius did not surrender Pyrrhus to Cassander and continued to keep him under his protection until eventually sat him on the throne of Epirus. For now, the Illyrian king aimed at regaining possession of the coastal area and forcing the Macedonians retreat from there. Glaucius quickly reorganized his troops and in 313 sieged the city of Apollonia. It was during this time that Acrotatus from Sparta who, up until now, had almost nothing to do with this conflict, conducted a forced naval landing in the area around the sieged city, forced here by a sea storm while on his way towards Acragas, modern Agrigento. Inside the city of Apollonia, the Macedonian garrison positioned there by Cassander, was leading the stance against the Illyrian king, thus attempting at the same time to ensure the Macedonian authority over an otherwise free colony. Acrotatus came into close contact with King Glaucius with whom he entered into peace negotiations on behalf of the citizens of Apollonia who were apparently influenced by a pro-Macedonian party. These negotiations were concluded with the Illyrian king signing a peace treaty with the city of Apollonia and releasing it from the siege. The terms of this treaty are unknown, but it can be assumed that they favoured the position of Glaucius and threatened the authority of the Macedonians. Thus, a political tension between a pro-Macedonian party and an opposition may have been triggered in the city of Apollonia. The Macedonian rule was undesired by the Hellenic colonies along the Adriatic and the Ionian Sea. Thus, in 312 the citizens in both Dyrrhachium and Apollonia revolted against the Macedonian rule and expelled the Macedonians from their cities. In their liberation the state of Corsera provided the main military assistance but it seems that Illyrians offered their support as well. After their liberation, Corsera awarded Glaucius with the control of Dyrrhachium. The following attempt of Cassander to regain these possession and especially Apollonia was useless. The forces of Apollonia along with possible Illyrian reinforces defeated the forces of Maston in front of the city walls. The whole coastal Illyria had now been freed from the Macedonian forces. Bibliography Ariani Alexandri and Abyssis Diodori Bibliotheca Historica Hammond, NGL, 1966 The Kingdoms in Illyria circa 400-167 BC The Annual British School at Athens, 61 240 to 253. Hammond, NGL and Woolbank, W, 1972. A History of Macedonia 336 to 167 BC pp 39-47. Plutarchi. Vitae Paralleli. Pyrrhus. Elijah, Q, 2012, Breteri Team Brita Elia. West Print. Tehran.